Before uh, coming here this uh, evening, uh, I thought to say something about what was lately on my mind, uh, what is on all our minds, whether we know it or not, uh, something that has swept through our lives and taken us up in ways that are useful and even spectacular, but also worrisome, and so ubiquitous and loomingly present in everything we do the way we communicate and take care of ourselves and find things out and look to be entertained, well, that would have to be the internet. So to begin, I want to congratulate those shortlisted content providers here this evening. <laughs> the World Wide Web was conceived as a somewhat academic thing some years ago but its years of realization and development since the 80s have seemed to me the work of a moment, coming into being um, as an astronomical event, a virtual world as a companion planet in orbital swing with our own. And its stuff, its substance, not mountains and seas and deserts and melting icebergs, but information, data, knowledge in every form of every kind, transmitted for every purpose, personal, governmental, commercial, educational, political. It is a companion world mind to create wealth, to educate, to bring news, to spy, to save lives, to make war. But my odd sense of it is something exploded into being has to do with a population putting itself eagerly into its arcane service as immigrants swearing fealty to a new world the techies, the programmers, the webmasters, the security experts, the hackers, almost as if it appeared, as it appeared, it created the people necessary to maintain it. And you wonder, or I wonder, what if there was no internet? What would these people have done with their lives? It was as if they were born for the virtual, so promptly and efficiently did they bond with it, work out its kinks, and deduce its possibilities. And this world of theirs is a world of simulation, clearly evidenced by its language. Never mind that text is now a verb. More radically, a search engine is not an engine. A platform is not a platform. A bookmark is not a bookmark because an e-book is not a book. And a cookie is not a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> a cloud is something that may be somewhere in the sky, although not there to produce weather. And surfing is an activity with neither a surfboard nor waves to ride. So language has been stolen or more charitably metamorphosized and we in this room especially have to appreciate metaphor. We're the descendants of writers who saw the sun as Zeus's chariot riding across the sky. Yet and yet. When was the last time on hearing the word mouse that you thought of a small rodent? <laughs> or heard the word web and thought of a spider? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, all that can be thought can be written. Man is the faculty of reporting, and the universe is the possibility of being reported. So Emerson would appreciate the internet. The universe is the possibility of being report, reported, suggests endless ascription and infinite surprise. And he might, Emerson, after a drink or two, think of global internet activity as a kind of oversoul. On my part, I think less mystically of an over-brain. You will find in the relevant Wikipedia entry, yes, the Wikipedia entry, a visualization of routing paths through a portion of the internet. What makes the picture uncanny is that it might easily be mistaken for a cross-section of the brain, the human brain. So, 
can we expect from the internet meta brain infinite manifestations of human genius and human inadequacy? I think so. For every advantage the internet devises for us, there is a disadvantage. For a wide web algorithmic breakthrough that shows us how to reduce pollution, for example, there's an algorithm for the quantification of persons into data. We're in everything we do, our predilections, our relations with others, our physical qualities, psychic conditions, our political beliefs, what we buy, what movies we watch, what books we read, if any, anything and everything about us broken down into data, the life substance of the companion world in cyberspace, mined in invasive expeditions in the name of commerce or of government surveillance, for the use of corporations and excited police departments. You can call it quantification. In the 60s, we called it reification, a kind of dehumanizing. And so it turns out that the prophetic story for all of this is oddly enough the eviction story from the Bronze Age, telling of the consequences coming from eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So like all worlds, the virtual comes with its heaven and its hell. What does this mean for all of us in this room, we writers and our publishers? We don't want to give up the presumably inconvenient thing we do, something as old as paginated written narrative. We don't want to lose heart as did Frank Norris, the author of naturalistic works of fiction in the late 19th century, the octopus McTeague. Norris despaired of the Western Union telegram, 10 words and stop. The Twitter of its day. He feared it was the end of literary discourse if people could expose them, express themselves completely in 10 words, the human mind would eventually be inaccessible to works of 100,000 words. And so the end of literary discourse, that was Norris's idea. But he also believed the typewriter was an enemy of creativity and how much more was imparted to a sentence written by hand rather than by a machine. We don't want to be today's Norris. Silly fellow he was, as there are those today who think writing on a computer is the death of great fiction. Writers thrive on adversary, adversity, and have ever since God stopped writing and humans took over the task. But there are internet dynamics that do challenge us. In fact, as concerns inter interactivity, one of the web world's waving flags the techies don't want to know that reading a book is the essence of interactivity, where the reader's life flows through the sentences as through an electric circuit, animating those sentences and bringing them to life in the mind so that it is only when a book is read that it is completed. Nothing else is in interactive as that. And a book is written in silence and read in silence, another advantage in our noisy world and integrity of the mind is maintained with the ability to live in an extended discourse. So that isn't the problem, nor is the major problem the digital undercutting of author's copyright and pirating of texts equivalent to what has happened to musicians, although that is a problem. You may have read a few days ago the results of a survey conducted by Penn not only that American writers worry about being the target of government surveillance, but that, quote, a significant portion of writers are engaging in self-censorship by avoiding research on certain controversial topics, choosing not to engage in sensitive conversations, and declining to pursue particular topics and stories when to pursue uh, particular topics and stories when doing so might lead to scrutiny by the U.S. government. So it's begun. That slowly gathering ghostly darkness coming off the other world technology, a kind of Chinese-like darkness, maybe, or call it the first step down the stairs to the internet world's hell. Hard to believe as we gather here this evening, flourishing, a flourishing example of Western democracy. 
But the struggle has begun as to whom will rule the webby of the world, government data miners and the corporations in league with them or everyone else. We'll have to take a deep breath, gather ourselves, and reluctantly or not, join that struggle. I don't have to remind us that everyone in this room is in the free speech business. Thank you for your kind of attention and my congratulations again to the wonderful shortlisted writers here this evening. Thank you. Thank you.